Dr. John D. turned off the light and stepped out of the enormous bedroom onto the balcony, resting his forearms on the metal railing and looking out over the city of Paris. It had rained earlier and the air was damp and chill, tainted with the sour smell from the Seine and the hint of exhaust fumes. He hated Paris. It had not always been that way. Once, this had been his favorite city in all of Europe, filled with the most wonderful and extraordinary memories. After all, he had been made immortal in this city. In a dungeon deep below the Bastille, the prison fortress, the crow goddess had taken him to the elder who had granted him eternal life in return for unquestioning loyalty. Dr. John Dee had worked for the elders, spied for them, undertaken many dangerous missions throughout countless shadow realms. He had fought armies of the dead and undead, pursued monsters across bitter wastelands, stolen some of the most precious and magical objects sacred to a dozen civilizations. In time, he had become the champion of the Dark Elders. Nothing was beyond him, no mission too difficult. Except when it came to the Flamels. The English magician had failed, over and over, to capture Nicholas and Prenelle Flamel several times in this very city. It remained one of the greatest mysteries of his long existence. How had the Flamels evaded him? He commanded an army of human, inhuman, and uh, abhuman agents. He had access to the birds of the air. He could command rats, dogs, and cats. He had his, at his disposal creatures from the darkest edges of mythology. But for more than 400 years, the Flamels had escaped capture, first here in Paris, then across Europe and into America, always staying one step ahead of him, often leaving town only hours before he arrived. It was almost as if they were being warned. But that, of course, was impossible. The magician shared his plans with no one. The door opened and closed in the room behind him. Dee's nostrils flared, smelling a hint of musty serpent. Good evening, Niccolo, Dee said without turning around. Welcome to Paris. Niccolo Machiavelli spoke Latin with an Italian accent. I trust you had a good flight and that the room is to your satisfaction. Machiavelli had arranged for Dee to be met at the airport and given a police escort to his grand townhouse off the Placha du Canada. Where are they? Dee asked rudely, ignoring his host's questions, asserting his authority. He might have been a few years younger than the Italian, but he was in charge. Machiavelli stepped out of the room and stood beside Dee on the balcony. Unwilling to wrinkle his suit against the metal railing, he stood with his hands clasped behind his back. Tall, elegant, clean-shaven Italian with close-cropped white hair was in great contrast with the small, sharp-featured man with his pointed beard and his gray hair pulled back in a tight ponytail. They are still in St. Germain's house, and Flamel has recently joined them. Dr. D glanced sidelong at Machiavelli. I'm surprised you are not tempted to try and capture them yourself, he said. Machiavelli looked over the city he controlled. Oh, I thought I would leave their final capture to you, he said mildly. You mean you're instructed to leave them to me, D snapped. Machiavelli said nothing. St. Germain's house is completely surrounded. Completely. And there are only five people in the house? No servants, no guards? The alchemist and St. Germain, the twins, and the shadow. Scout that shall be a problem, Dee muttered. I may have a solution, Machiavelli suggested softly. He waited until the magician turned to look at him, his stone gray eyes blinking orange in the reflected streetlights. I sent for the Decia, Scatach's fiercest foes. Three of them have just arrived. A rare smile curled Dee's thin lips. Then he moved back from Machiavelli and bowed slightly. The Valkyries, a truly excellent choice. We are on the same side, Machiavelli bowed in return. We serve the same masters. The magician was about to step back into the room when he stopped and turned to look at Machiavelli. For a moment, the faintest rotten egg hint of sulfur hung in the air. You have no idea whom I serve, he said. Dagon threw open the tall double doors and stepped back. Niccolo Machiavelli and Dr. John D. strode into the ornate book-filled library to greet their visitors. There were three young women in the room. At first glance, they were so alike they could have been triplets. Tall and thin, with shorter-length blonde hair, they were dressed alike in black tanks under soft leather jackets and blue jeans tucked into knee-high boots. Their faces were all angles, sharp cheekbones, deeply sunken eyes, pointed chins. Only their eyes helped to distinguish them. They were different shades of blue, from the palest sapphire to deep, almost purple indigo. 
All three looked as if they might have been 16 or 17, but in actuality, they were older than most civilizations. They were the Desir. Machiavelli stepped into the center of the room and turned to look at each of the girls in turn, trying to tell them apart. One was sitting at the grand piano, another lounging on the sofa, while a third leaned against a window, staring out into the night, an unopened leather-bound book in her hands. As he got closer, their heads pivoted, and he noticed that their eye colors matched their nail polish. Thank you for coming, he said, speaking Latin, which, along with Greek, was the one language most of the elders were familiar with. The girls looked at him blankly. Machiavelli glanced at Dagon, who had stepped into the room and closed the door behind him. He pulled off his glasses, revealing his bulbous eyes, and spoke quickly in a language no human throat or tongue could shape. The women ignored him. Dr. John D. sighed dramatically. He dropped into a high-backed leather armchair and clapped his small hands together with a sharp crack. Enough of this nonsense, he said in English. You're here for Scottach. Now, do you want her or not? The girl sitting at the piano stared at the magician. If he noticed that her head was now twisted at an impossible angle, he didn't react. Where is she? Her English was perfect. Close by, not Machiavelli said, moving slowly around the room. The three girls directed their attention to him, heads turning to track him like owls following a mouse. What is she doing? She is protecting the alchemist Flamel, Saint Germain, and two human eye, Machiavelli said. We only want the human eye and Flamel. Scatach is yours. He paused, then added, You can have Saint Germain, too, if you want him. He's of no use to us. The shadow. We just want the shadow. The woman sitting at the piano said. Her indigo-tipped fingers moved across the keys, the sound delicate and beautiful. Machiavelli crossed to a side table and poured coffee from a tall silver pot. He looked at Dee and raised his eyebrows and the pot at the same time. The magician shook his head. You should know that Scatach is still powerful, Machiavelli continued, speaking now to the women seated at the piano. The pupils of her indigo eyes were narrow and horizontal. She knocked out a unit of highly trained police officers yesterday morning. Human eye, the Desir almost spat. You human eye can stand up against the shadow. But we are not human eye, the woman that's standing at the window said. We are the Desir finished the woman sitting across from D. We are the shield maidens, the choosers of the dead, the warriors of... Yes, 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 D said impatiently. We know who you are. Valkyries, probably the greatest warriors the world has ever seen, according to yourselves anyway. We want to know if you can defeat the shadow. The Desir with indigo eyes swiveled her body away from the piano and flowed smoothly to her feet. She stalked across the carpet to stand before D. Her two sisters were suddenly by her side, and the temperature in the room abruptly plummeted. It would be a mistake to mock us, Dr. D, one said. D sighed. Can you defeat the shadow? he asked again. Because if you cannot, then I'm sure there are others who will be more only too delighted to try. He held up his cell phone. I can call upon Amazons, Samurai, and Bogatiers. The temperature in the room continued to fall as D spoke, and his breath plummeted white in the air, ice crystals forming on his eyebrows and beard. Enough of this trickery! D snapped his fingers, and his aura flashed briefly yellow. The room grew warm, then hot, heavy with the stink of rotten eggs. There is no need for these lesser warriors. The Desir will slay the Shadow. How? D snapped. We have what those other warriors have not. You're talking in riddles! D said impatiently. Tell him, Machiavelli said. The Desir with the palest eyes turned her head in his direction, then looked back at D. Long fingers flickered toward his face. You destroyed Yggdrasil and released our pet creature, which had been long trapped in the roots of the world tree. Something flickered behind D's eyes, and a muscle twitched at the corner of his mouth. Needhog, he looked at Machiavelli. You knew about this? Machiavelli nodded. Of course. The Desir with indigo eyes stepped up to D and looked down into his face. Yes, you freed Needhog, the devourer of corpses. Still leaning toward D, she swiveled her head to look at Machiavelli. Her sisters also turned in his direction. Take us to where the Shadow and the others are hiding, then leave us. Once we have loose Needhog, Skatach is doomed. 
Can you control the creature? Machiavelli asked curiously. Once it feeds off the shadow, consumes first her memories and then her flesh and bones, it will need to sleep. After a feast like Scat that, it would probably sleep for a couple of centuries. We would recapture it then. Niccolo Machiavelli nodded. We didn't even discuss your fee. The three Desir smiled, and even Machiavelli, who had seen horrors, recalled from the expressions on their faces. There is no fee, the Desir said with indigo eyes. This we will do to restore the honor of our clan and avenge our fallen family. Scatthatch the Shadow destroyed many of our sisters. Machiavelli nodded. I understand. When will you attack? At dawn. Why not now? Dee demanded. We are creatures of the twilight, in that no time between night and day we are at our strongest, one said. That is when we are invincible, her sister added.